Hi, uh, my name is Billy Riggs and it's a delight to present uh, some of the research and work that I've been doing in San Francisco uh, uh, with a uh, level four uh, ride share. Um, I believe this is some of the first work out there that explores uh, rider behavior in uh, level four last mile automated or autonomous vehicles. So my pleasure to do this. Uh, Billy Riggs with the University of San Francisco. Uh, I'm a professor of management and engineering, just for some background. Um, prior to University of San Francisco, I was at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, San Jose State, and UC Berkeley. And I have background as a practitioner in uh, environmental uh, and landscape uh, planning, as well as transportation engineering. Uh, my PhD is from UC Berkeley. Um, I have written over uh, 100 publications, uh, numerous peer-reviewed, um, but I've uh, in two books, which uh, we'll come back to. Um, some of my projects dealt with physical planning uh, for the U.S. Coast Guard and in engineering of pier site facilities when I used to be a professional, but also neighborhood design, and and I worked on a lot number of the the pilot lead neighborhood design projects. I um, also have background as an investor in working with startup companies, um, both in the battery recycling, energy space, working for a hydrogen company called Hydra, but also uh, data and fintech uh, companies, um, and uh, some of which are illustrated here, uh, Atmos Financial, for example, Distributed Media Labs, and most recently working a lot with my own company called Intensity on um, civic blockchain for uh, municipal infrastructure investment. And, uh, but, you know, I think I want to start off kind of with a bigger aperture that in the U.S., you know, there's a lot of automated vehicle frameworks, long haul trucking, last mile logistics. Um, and it's not just robo taxis, it's not just these last mile right here. It's also uh, automated shuttles, which we see um, both in the EU and um, uh, Japan, China. So I think it's important to keep that in context. Um, we've done a lot of work in uh, use cases with regard to handicap accessibility or disabled access. Uh, here's a publication that you can access with Anurag Pandey, one of my colleagues from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. But what I really wanna focus on today is the case study um, and, and, and that I've talked about in numerous contexts recently, this case study of the thousands of rides we've had taken um, with, in partnership with Cruz uh, and as you know, Cruise and Waymo have been launching level four service, um, fully self-driving, uh, not infrastructure dependent service in San Francisco. And so when we step back and, and I like to say that this is step back and describe what this service looks like, it's really uh, an Uber without a driver. Okay. And, and so think of it as rideshare within an operational design domain, domain, an ODD, operational design domain that is fully autonomous autonomous does not require V to X requirements. There's been some debate recently about like what type of supervision it requires and per policy, it requires remote supervision still, but there's no fixed route. It's all happening by the self with everything on board that is required to operate these vehicles. And this is just exemplary. The map here exemplifies the cruise area of service. So again, from a V to X standpoint, no V to X requirement. There's a generalizable software stack with sensors that are referencing a 3D uh, 3D map. Um, you know that we the companies are sharing some, somewhere between you know three uh, and 100 centimeters based on the company that you speak to. Um, Cruz and Waymo both have have launched about 300 vehicle robo taxi uh, fleets. Um, Contrary to kind of some stuff that's been reported in the media, the, the term teleoperations is not something that either of these companies engages in. Uh, um, they are able to assist the vehicles if they get out of the jam, but it's not teledriving. And I think that's an important distinction to make because it, it get, gets lost in the details a little bit. Um, when we think about what's happening too, if they're pursuing fleet operations. So the business model is different than what's happening, you know, a traditional Uber or Lyft model. Um, they also intend to pursue uh, purpose-built platforms. You can see here um, the Cruise Origin, which is the production vehicle for Cruise. Waymo is pursuing a vehicle called the Zeker. Now, 
uh, from an operational standpoint, let's dial down to kind of the experiment that I did. There's a sophisticated policy process in California um, that's being replicated in a number of places around the world. We won't go into that process today, but I'm happy to take questions about that. And if you'd like to hear more about that, I can talk about uh, what that means. Um, but it, it goes through an iterative process. From our standpoint, we engage in a pilot uh, ride share experiment in these level four vehicles with crews in uh, 2021, 22, launching with uh, early riders in 2022 um, that were students just to explore what would happen if we actually gave these vehicles this transportation resource. Now, again, this policy process is iterative and requires a number of different regulatory approvals, both from a driving safety standpoint, the, the equivalent of a digital driver's license, but also in terms of the ability to carry passengers. And for example, we were able to get in because we were not fare rides. We came in early before the public was able to access these vehicles. These vehicles are now ability to access throughout San Francisco publicly. Our students actually, the pilot riders, um, were able to test them within this operational design domain, the ODD, which we refer to uh, in humorous standpoint uh, as to the, called the dog. Um, but keep in mind this operational design domain it's important to articulate. It's not just geography, okay? It's not just a, a geofence. It's it's really graded by roadway type, um, relative to speed, relative to weather, and relative to time. And it's important to emphasize time because what we were doing was designing an experiment that was an after hours experiment. And why that's important is because this was when this population was very transit dependent, was least served by public transportation. And I want to anchor to that because what we're really seeing here, and I'll just won't bury the lead, um, and this is kind of a little bit of a cross section of who these people were, um, really members of our, our community and representative of the diversity of San Francisco. Um, you know, this was a very transit dependent population. Um, and when we look at how the, these, these individuals primarily travel during the day, um, they were taking transit and they were going to school, work errands, um, and after hours, they were engaging in social activities, but they were highly, highly dependent on cars after hours because transit service in many cities in the U.S. and I would argue many cities around the, the, the world becomes harder to have access to during late night hours when there's less uh, less trips, trips, trip density. There's less opportunity for public transit operators to make revenue. Um, and so what we have is this inversion of, of demand and that leads to more driving, particularly in nighttime hours. So we felt like this was a really important first step in understanding what would happen when uh, public transportation was a, was a, was least resourced. Uh, and so in terms of what we found was that when we gave students these resources, and you can download the paper that's been peer reviewed here uh, using this QR code, uh, what we really found was that we weren't seeing a, a you know, taking rides from transportation, we were seeing that existing ride share was a big market opportunity. Uh, and also that we saw that there wasn't a lot of new travel happening on the network, but there was a lot of substitution with existing, for example, ride share app applications. So 55% of what we were seeing on the network was actually existing travel that was happening via Uber, uh, Lyft, uh, tools like that. Um, it's interesting because we're already seeing a collapsing in this industry, and I want to anchor to this as well. We're already seeing this interoperability between rideshare and um, potential partnerships with cities. Um, here's um, here are two programs in Southern California, both in Pasadena and a city called Monrovia, um, that are using such a service. Uh, we see these in a number of places around the world already. Um, but what we really kind of I think need to anchor to here is that, yeah, there is some impact on, on public transport. Um, but in general, we're seeing, uh, you know, these individuals, they might've walked late at night, but more often than not, they were relying on their private, uh, private vehicles. Um, why were they traveling? Most often they were traveling related to uh, recreational purposes, but they were also going out for errands and work-based trips. And I think that's really important because when we think about why people travel, 
during off peak hours, it's not just, uh, well, it's important to actually reduce, for example, people that will drive and for example, go out uh, to a bar or to, to a, an event where they may um, imbibe alcohol or, or other, um, you know, kind of other forms of recreation. There's also utilitarian trips that happen after hours. And this is an important to, thing to anchor to. What we also found was that it's not, price was not just a, an indicator. Uh, it goes back to why many people use rideshare. The fact that it's like uh, easy to access, there's ease of payment, there's a safe alternative. Uh, you don't need to park, there's a reliable service. And so these are areas for opportunity for public transportation systems, but they're also areas where we know that rideshare uh, capitalized on an additional uh, transportation market that wasn't served and induced a lot of demand early on uh, because they were just providing a different service that was more reliable and convenient. Uh, they weren't just another taxi, which is the citing a paper by my colleague Lisa Real, uh, Robert Severo, and Susan Shaheen. Um, here's a good quote from one of our writers is that just talking about how there wasn't great bus service and that this was pretty darn awesome that there was a cruise vehicle around. Um, we also saw a lot of, of women that were really more comfortable driving, not having a driver. Um, and they were even to the extent of actually sharing rides within an affinity group because they could understand this was another validated user. Um, so I think there's there's a lot that we can do there. I think there's a little bit of perception of, of safety issues with a, a lot of female populations in, uh, in the U.S. and in other countries where there's been instances of, of assaults or aggression in, in rideshare vehicles. And so that's something we also saw in our discussions with people. And then if we wanna kind of scratch the service more, we recent interviews and we're, we're getting ready to release more data on this. Uh, we've seen the students respond to really feeling more comfortable when they aren't riders. They see these vehicles as actually slowing down traffic and being a part of overall pedestrian safety because they're actually metering other cars on the road. So, you know, I, I jokingly say that many times we, when we drive our vehicles, we have no problem exceeding the speed limit and forgetting that we sometimes are pedestrians. And the worst thing for pedestrians is, is a vehicle that's traveling too fast and endangering, um, endangering them. So I, I think that's really important to keep in mind. So, okay, let's step back. What are our lessons here? You know, our lessons and opportunities um, for, uh, based on these types of experiments is really kind of, there's, a, there's an opportunity here for, to potentially continue to work on policy processes. We have agile policy here in San Francisco Bay Area in California, and I think that's a lesson, but there's also opportunities to refine that. We didn't speak about that a lot today, but it's an important thing that we might come back to, and I'm happy to take questions on that. Um, we'll talk about some tensions later on about emergency vehicle and construction uh, data that could be shared. Um, there's also an opportunity for business models, uh, new business models, new vehicle opportunities, as well as thinking about potential infrastructure. I tend to think that, and I advise cities, don't do purpose-built infrastructure, just focus on signs, lines, and potholes look at network efficiency. Um, let's look a little bit about that. I mean, I think one of the things that we, we've we seen um, an opportunity to, to look at recently is looking at instances of in-lane stops, of, in, of, of these corner case issues where you have a vehicle, maybe an automated vehicle that does disengage, that actually gets into a sticky situation and has to pull over and take itself out of service, um, creating dynamic, and dynamic dialogue, but also dynamic systems to try to deal with that as an important kind of next step, um, because we've seen some resolvable issues in San Francisco, where we've seen a stop in front of a fire truck, or we've seen, um, you know, a first responder or um, kind of forget that the protocols of interacting with his vehicles and smash a window. Um, we've also seen some issues where the vehicle will struggle to pull out of a traffic lane and cause traffic. Um, now, whether or not traffic is actually bad for multimodal transportation, because tra you know more traffic and more and reduced level of service from a vehicular function standpoint does slow down traffic, and it actually encourages people to 
to get out of vehicles, whether or not that's a bad thing, I think that's to be baited by the academy and by experts like us. But, you know, in terms of being transparent, in terms of traffic operations, I think there's an important infrastructure discussion that can be had and particularly sharing construction data because construction data that interrupts 3D maps is really important. And there was a recent instance with or with crews and a pedestrian collision that is super complicated. There's a diagnostic link here if you want to look at it. It is one of these corner cases, and yet in California, it's caused a lot of reflection on uh, how we handle these type of issues and what happens in these corner case situations. Ultimately, there's an opportunity for public transportation or, or organizations as well as OEMs to, to really rethink what is the platform. Is it smaller vehicles? Is it um, is it how do we focus on multimodal transportation at the same time as we look at new forms, new shuttles, new forms of rideshare, um, new services that can be delivered during the vehicle? For example, you know, in the cruise vehicles, you can take quizzes about San Francisco. And this is one of my favorite quizzes about the, the love bug, which is a classic 1950s kind of or 1968 comedy movie about this bug, this uh, VW bug, Herbie, uh, that has a mind of its own. It was one of the first, you know, the kind of the early depictions of an autonomous vehicle that was a, a little Volkswagen race car. Um, but you can see here that this is there's a really an opportunity to kind of reinvent what it is. And, you know, this, you know, I, I many times since it's a show, uh, a show, um, uh, we, we par partnered with the show project quite a bit. You know, you can see here some of the interesting use cases that are happening as a part of um, some of the innovative things they're doing as a part of this project. And this is the bus depot that I know that um, the show team has has worked on, I believe, with uh, in, in Madrid. Um, but we're also seeing stuff in Germany with ZF, um, with some Navia shuttles, E-Mile shuttles, but also the cruise origin on the far left and the Waymo Zeker innovating the platform. And it's important to, to think about these innovations in platform because right now these fleet deployments are really um, the most fiscally um, the, the most fiscally prudent model. Um, Fleet-based organizations have an incentive to uh, reduce wasted travel on the network, reduce ghost miles because that those ghost miles uh, reduce revenues. And I think that's important to keep in mind because it's a completely different business model than uh, the uh, the model that, for example, Uber and Lyft have who don't own their fleet. So the miles that are consumed on the roadway, you know, Uber and Lyft aren't paying for it. They're just actually getting revenue from the ride that they then share with the gig worker. So um, that's an important feature, particularly in our undergirding in terms of how we look at prioritizing sustainable mobility, particularly looking at uh, the relationship with the crew, the relationship with uh, cycling, the relationship to the pickup and drop off environment, um, and looking at like what I call curb maximization. And we think about that, that's even challenging some of the notions that uh, transit needs exclusive curb because many times what we're seeing is public transit agencies maybe use the curb that they're allocated between 70, uh, you know, uh, between, you know, 20 and 30% of the time. So it's, it's, you know, we have vacant curb that is is restricted to public transit agencies um, 70 to 80% of the time. And so what do we do with that? How can we use that research resource more efficiently? Uh, I've done a lot of work recently on looking at curbs, but also using networks more efficiently. And this is a paper that I'd be delighted if you if you're interested in this idea of looking at network efficiency and how just making the network more efficient for existing vehicles as well as automated vehicles can actually have impacts in terms of uh, BMT and ultimately uh, carbon. Uh, and this is a paper with uh, Jeff Boeing, my colleague from USC. Um, and ultimately, I think that when we think about our urban conditions, if we, if we kind of scratch the surface more, the lesson from this is actually that it's not just about automated vehicles, it's about rethinking roadways and prioritizing how we can actually think about urban form and think about it in a different way that actually recaptures urban right away for human travel. And I, I, I you know, I, I distilled it down with a colleague, Mark Schlossberg, Adam Miller Ball, and Elizabeth Shea with this idea of thinning lanes, removing parking and thinking shared. Um, 
and but it really can involve a radical rethinking of how we use our public right of way and reducing private occupancy vehicles pov so right away opportunities that they require a reduction in private occupancy vehicles um Here's some more of my literature. You know, I, I talk a lot about more about this idea of right away reduction and um, reallocation. My book Into the Road that came out in 2020, late 2022. Um, happy to entertain any questions. Um, and again, uh, a lot of links to the work that we've done on this research writer program that you can take advantage of. And uh, here's my email and contact information if you'd like to reach out and have any questions. Thank you very much, and I'm glad to share uh, a lot of this with with these these various audiences that that I've had the opportunity to speak with. Thank you so much, and and take care.